spy. My wife is not a spy. If she is, we need to keep her in place for 72 hours so that we can identify her handler and clean out the rest of her circuit. No. If it is proven that your wife is a spy, routine procedures in cases of intimate betrayal will apply. You will execute her with your own hand, and if we discover that you are an accomplice in any way, you will be hanged for high treason, Wing Commander Vatan, do you understand? And that's a clip from Allied. I'm delighted to say that it's director Robert Zemeckis uh, is, is with us on the program. Robert, hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, how are you? I'm very good, how are you, sir? Very good. It's a, a, a pleasure and an honor to have you on the program. We've talked about your movies for so many years. Uh, so to finally have you on is terrific. Tell us about Allied, tell us about this story. How did you get involved? Um, I read the screenplay, a very, a very early draft of the screenplay, Stephen Knight's screenplay, and um, I was uh, attracted to it immediately. I thought it had beautifully drawn characters and uh, certainly um, dramatic dilemmas that the, the characters are thrust into, which kept me turning the pages. And so anytime that happens, I take a serious interest in the project. And briefly, and without spoiling anything, obviously, what, uh, what is the, the main story that, we're, that you're telling here? It's a story about intimate betrayal. Obviously, it's got very high stakes because the backdrop of World War II and the fact that these characters are uh, SOE agents and they're you know in that kind of world of uh, spies. But the actual theme, the glue, the emotional core of what these characters go through, I think, is a universal theme. This idea that you know, this person I'm really close to, I may not know exactly who they are or what, you know, and, and I think no matter what the, the, the setting for that, it's something that um, people who are in any type of relationship, whether it's a romantic relationship or a work relationship or friendship, can identify with. Uh, the SOE agents that you're talking about, Brad Pitt and Marion Cotillon, just to get this absolutely right, she, she's, she's French. Brad has a bad Parisian accent mm -hmm. in your film because he has a, because he has a, he's from Quebec, so he has a good Quebecois. Right accent was that actually quite difficult for brad Pitt? i mean i don't know how good his french is but is, is that quite a difficult oh, it's very difficult well, it's, uh, right. well i i well listen i don't know how to speak french at all and i've worked with uh this is actually uh, ironically the second film that i've done where i've had to do, i've had to do this in a row it's very complicated f to learn correct french and but brad was very committed and he uh, really wanted to do it and he worked very hard and i mean he loves the language he loves france i mean he has a place in in france uh where a uh, house in france so he worked very hard on it now you know you, you know he he also had um marianne who was happy to coach him who is a linguistic genius you know she can do anything perfectly so he, he had a very how would I say this strict mentor if you will who was really watching him very closely and you know making sure that he did it exactly how it should be because the, the opening stages of the movie we, we see him arriving on a parachute mm -hmm. it's impossibly glamorous this uh, this opening sequence in Casablanca and their opening exchanges are in French and I suppose right at that beginning we everyone has to believe that they are a couple and that their French is perfect. Mm -hmm. Exactly, that's how it has to be presented. It's kind of like, okay, well, who are these people? And now, and now they're pretending to be a couple, and now they're not a couple, and now that we're seeing that they're on a mission together, and the whole thing is very well crafted to keep you interested in where, you know, you're, you know when, you, when you're reading a screenplay like this, you're sitting there asking yourself, where's this story going? Mm -hmm. This is very fascinating, I hope. It does feel like a classic Hollywood studio movie, and it is impossibly glamorous. Mm -hmm. Is that is that fair? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I never, you know, I just again, I, you know, I, I, it all came from the, it all came from the page. It all came from the way it was written. It was written in a in a way that evoked these images and evoked this feeling and evoked this uh, world that these people uh, move in, and it it all kind of grew from that. And I think that every department that kind of felt that when they were building the the costumes or the or the sets or whatever, and it kind of just kind of came together that way. When did you realize that you had uh, two stars with fantastic chemistry between them? Because um, you can't make that happen. No, and, and the only, you know, I was uh, sitting at the rehearsal table with these two actors together for three weeks and, and had no idea until the first time we did, I guess it was on our second or third day of um, working with the two of them in a very quiet scene where 
I could see in the monitor that they had magnificent on-screen chemistry. And you don't know until that moment. I mean, you can't tell by looking at two people in real life, if you will. It's something that happens in two dimensions. It's something that happens once they are recorded with a lens. And it, it, it's something that you're either fortunate enough to have or, or not. And I wonder if all the gossip which spins out from that is actually a product of the movie that you've created. Because when you see that kind of chemistry, we, we're, we're along for the ride. Yeah, because, you, you know, because it's so, uh, you, you can't define it and it's so powerful that you can only try to project on it what you know. And, of course, that's, it's, you know, we have these terms, you know, you've heard the, this term, the magic of the movies. And this is one of the magic things that happen in movies is this, this, this thing we call on-screen chemistry between two actors, which is just something that happens. Yeah. And your sandstorm scene, if you didn't have any chemistry, that would have been a difficult scene. Oh, yeah. That, just you know, that, that's, you're, you're either, yeah, that's, you either have it or you don't. It doesn't feel, when people come out of it, they won't be saying that's an effects heavy movie. Everyone knows you've always been at the cutting edge of, edge of technology and you like your effects. But I imagine recreating London was an interesting challenge, wartime London. Oh, yeah, because, you know, very little of it is around anymore. So uh, you have to, you know, so we used, you know, extensive use of digital, what we call set extensions to create the period and, and create the sort of backdrop of what was going on in World War II. World War II does seem to be, I mean, maybe more than any other period in history, an endless source of fascination for filmmakers. Even mm. When you think you've seen everything, there's another story. Because I think this was inspired by a true story. So we haven't seen everything. Yeah, well, I have a theory about that. I have a theory about World War II. I have a theory, I have a, it, it, well, first of all, it was an incredibly dramatic time. I mean, you know, the whole world was at war and the stakes couldn't have been higher. And, you know, everything was at stake. That's number one. But number two is it's interesting because the way people lived during the 1940s isn't really that different than the way we live now. A lot of things have changed, but we still sort of, our transportation is similar, our communication is somewhat similar, you know, our, you know, the things that we did for recreation, the way we lived. So we can go back into the past, but not the distant past, which makes it impossible to identify with. And so having this incredibly dramatic event in human history happen at a time which is still similar to what we have now, I think makes it a lot of uh, stories that are still relevant can be set. Amy Adams was on the show a few weeks back uh, talking about Arrival, which is a terrific movie. And I said to her in the interview, it reminded me of Contact, mm -hmm. that there was something about, I mean, I think she's reminds me of Jodie Foster a little anyway, but there was something about that movie that reminded me of Contact. I don't know if you've seen I have it. Uh, Arrival. I haven't yet. But, but, I, I, wonder, I, but I wonder if it's ready to be reappraised. Well, why not? Time to get that. You, well, okay. <laughs> right, right. well, I'm now recommending, Robert Zemeckis, that you go and see Arrival because I think you'll go and see it and go, hmm. Yeah, well, I think I'll probably enjoy it. I hear it's very good. You're absolutely and I, and right. I'm a big fan of, of Amy Adams. I think she's fantastic. You know, so, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it. We've got some listeners' questions. Uh, we asked on our website, question for Robert Zemeckis. Most of them were all about Biff Tannen. Okay. So, uh, which is worth saying again, Back to the Future, Biff Tannen, that's originally Donald Trump, yes? Well, that's what, uh, you, you know, I mean, uh, Bob Gale, I think Bob Gale said somewhere in, in a uh, interview somewhere that it was based on Donald Trump, and it was, and, and, and it's true, <laughs> because that was sort of the Donald Trump time when he was building, you know, these lavish casinos in Atlantic City and putting his name on them, big gold letters and things like that. Yeah. That's a fairly astonishing spot, though, from your writer. Yeah, uh, it is. I mean, it's, you know, it, it, it's, you know, and, 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 cor and of course, when you know, Biff in the sequel, he kind of wore his hair that way, too. Has he, do, do you know whether Donald Trump has commented about that? Or? I don't know. I don't know. You might I get a no. kind of Hamilton treatment. I might. You never know. And, and, and uh, Graham Laws uh, on this episode in Back to the Future 2, you predicted that the Cubs would win the World Series. Yes, but we were a year off. But I think that had to do with something about the, the, the space-time continuum. I'm not quite sure that the world, uh, the Earth, turns exactly at the speed that we might think. So I think we were actually right. Sean Elstob, if you were making Castaway now, would you go the CGI route and perhaps with a combination of motion capture or body replacement techniques like Matt Damon in The Martian, or would you still do it live and in camera and have Tom Hanks' weight loss be real? 
you know, I my feeling about these things are, you know, I would, um, I would, I would use the tools that I have at the time, so the movie would look different. And I don't know what to say about the weight loss thing. We might, you know, we might or we might not. I, the thing that I, I think are interesting about films is that that they're actually the films themselves are historical documents, and the fact that that movie was made with everything inside the camera makes that film unique to what the time to the time that it was made in. And so. I don't really know how to answer that question. I would use, I guess I, the answer would be I would use every tool at my disposal if I were making a movie like that now. Another question from our Facebook page from Johnny Vaughan. Was the omission of music score, we're on the same movie here, uh, in the island section of Castaway deliberately done to create a feeling of isolation? Or have I mistakenly been teaching that to my film students? I've been dying to ask this question for years. Please tell me it wasn't just an accident, Mr. Zemeckis. No, it was done completely by design, and he's 100% correct, and he can continue to tell that to his students. Boom. Gavin Gibson, do you see yourself getting back into science fiction anytime soon? I'm sure fans of Contact and the Back to the Future trilogy, like myself, would love to see you back in the director's chair of a science fiction masterpiece. Um, you know, again, I have no, I don't put any genre agenda on myself. I'm attracted to whatever is a good story or good screenplay or good idea that comes my way. And if a um, compelling science fiction story comes my way, I'd be more than happy to do it. What are you working on next? I'm doing a movie with Steve Carell, which is, you know, I can only describe it as a very strange movie. It's called The Women of Marwin, and it's based on the, there was a documentary called Marwin Call. It's a very, very complicated movie, but it's, um, it's going to have uh, humor, action, pathos, suspense, everything in it. Robert Zemeckis, a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your I time. I appreciate it. Thank you.